cherry. <laughs> Strawberry. I'm not sure. Definitely strawberry. Tasting food and finding out what it is begins here. On your tongue. When you put food into your mouth to eat, it falls onto your tongue, which is covered in tiny taste receptors, or taste buds. Now, these taste buds are receptive to four different kinds of taste. And each type of taste bud has its own particular place on the tongue. But you don't need to look into my mouth. Try this one for size. The taste buds responding to bitter are at the back of the tongue, sour along the sides, salt at the tip, and sweet is down the middle. Ever since I was a young boy, I played the silver ball. From Soho down to Brighton, I must have played them all. But I ain't seen nothing like him in any amusement hall. That deaf, dumb, and flying kid sure plays a mean pin. Each different kind of taste bud works rather like a lock, with a food substance as the key. A door will only unlock using the right key. And in the same way, each taste bud can only be unlocked by something in the food that fits it, rather like a key in a lock. Food comes in large pieces. This lump of sugar, for example, is absolutely enormous compared with the taste buds or receptors on your tongue. For this lump of sugar to behave as a key to fit into the lock or receptor, it needs to be broken down. This happens in the mouth, firstly by chewing into smaller particles and then by dissolving in the saliva. Sugar, like almost everything else, is made of molecules, which are far too small to see. The water molecules bump into the sugar, and sugar molecules break away from the lump of sugar into the water. This is what we call dissolving. But that can't be the whole story. There are 40 different flavours of jelly bean, and it's easy to tell them apart but the tongue alone can't account for that. Just four different taste buds couldn't explain our ability to identify the thousands of different flavours we experience. And this apple doesn't only taste sweet, but a bit of sour. It tastes of apple. Now, when I lift this apple towards my mouth, I can smell it. Vapour from the apple wafts up my nose and over the smell receptors up here, at the top. And when I actually take a bite... <laughs> an eating machine at the Eureka Museum in Halifax to show how smell and taste work together when you eat an apple. The front teeth chop up the food and a squirt of saliva begins to dissolve it. More chewing and stimulation for the taste buds right at the back of the mouth just before swallowing vapors from the food waft up the nasal passages and over the smell receptors so the flavor of food is a combination of signals from your taste receptors in your mouth and smell receptors in your nose and you can prove it hold your nose don't know and see how hard it is to identify a flavour. Don't know. I don't know. Jerry. Don't know. Many animals have a better sense of smell than humans. Now then, lass, I've got a biscuit here. Now, where do you think this is going to go? Where do you think it's gone? You tell me which fish hand do you think this biscuit has gone into? You reckon? Yes! <laughs> and for some animals, smell can actually affect the amount they eat. These are working cats, professional food tasters, 
whose preferences might decide what your cat eats in the future. Now resting in their home. Well, what we're trying to do is look at the effect of smell on cats feeding. Ready for the day's work. Come on then. So off we go. And today's task is tasting biscuits, both with and without a fishy smell or odour. So here we have an air pump. Air that is generated by this air pump can either bypass the glass flask and then go into this blue tubing, which is, then takes the air into the room with the cats and then it passes over the plain dry biscuit. Now alternatively, the air can pass through the glass flask and in this case, the glass flask contains sardines. And then the odour from that food passes again through the blue tube and into the um, cat room where the dry biscuit is. What we found is that the uh, air that doesn't have the odour in the biscuit doesn't stimulate the cats to start feeding. Uh, they will eat some of the plain dry biscuit, but until you pass the odour over the biscuit, it's at that point that the cats will start eating the biscuit. So the amount of biscuit that's eaten over the same period of time will be a lot more once you start passing odour over the biscuit. Humans can be tempted by smells in a similar way, and the shops certainly know it. Go for some of that. Smell is such a vital element of flavour that new flavours are even designed by smell and not by taste. If I'm given a project to make a new flavour, um, then firstly what I would do is I would go out to the shops and try and obtain the product. In the case of strawberry, I would spend probably about a week actually just tasting them, thinking about making the flavour so that my brain um, can think about strawberry, can really analyse what the flavour of strawberry is. When you cut a strawberry, it breaks the cells down, which normally contain the juices. These juices then evaporate. Uh, by this we mean that the molecules escape into the air. These molecules are composed of many different types of chemicals, and together they make up a strawberry smell. The juices released from the strawberry, which we've just cut open, continue to evaporate into the air. If we put these pieces of strawberries in the jar and seal the jar, the vapour containing the smell components will build up in the jar and by morning we will have a very concentrated form of smell. When I open the, the lid the, the following day, I would actually get a concentrate of the flavour um, and it would <laughs> really last for about a minute and in that minute I would try and analyse um, what sort of chemicals and characters are present in that vapour. You can actually break down the flavour into characters, characteristics and associated with all these characters are specific um, chemicals which you would use in the strawberry. They're found in strawberry, in the real strawberry, and they're the correct characters to use, the correct chemicals to use. For something like raspberry, the, the, the chemicals would be different, although the characters might be similar. Raspberries are fruity and they're, they're also ripe, but we'd use different chemicals. So what we're trying to do when we're, we're making the flavour is actually um, reproduce what's going on in nature. But a colleague can find out exactly what's going on in nature by a chemical analysis. 
first problem we have in analysing strawberries is to separate the flavour, which represents probably 10 parts per million of a strawberry, away from the other components of a strawberry, which are water, sugar, plant cells, etc. And we end up with an extract of the strawberries, which looks something like this. Now this extract will contain all of the flavour chemicals of the strawberry. We have to separate these chemicals and to identify them. Now we separate the chemicals by using a tube which looks like this. And what we do is by using a syringe and injecting them into a tube. The different chemicals are forced along the tube and they all go at different speeds. So when they get to the end of the tube, which is 50 metres long, they're coming out one at a time and so they're pure and they're separated. You can think of it as being rather like a race. In the beginning, the components of the strawberry flavour, like the skiers, are bunched together and hard to tell apart. As they pass along the tube, or the race course, some go faster than others, so they separate. Once they've separated, they can be looked at one at a time and identified. The chemicals go along the tube and they come out here and they're passed along one by one into this machine which is called a mass spectrometer and the, this machine produces patterns which are unique for chemicals so it is in effect it's producing a chemical fingerprint if we can obtain this fingerprint we can then recognize the chemical the strawberry analysis is then sent back to Marie and this is the printout of the strawberry analysis there are 130 components and my strawberry flavour will probably contain about um, 20 to 25 components. Most of the components in the analysis um, will probably not really contribute to the strawberry flavour or will make it taste nasty. You're probably thinking, well, why do the analysis now? But it does help us. It tells us um, perhaps what fruity characters to use or green characters and we just miss out on the musty and the stale characters and we just concentrate on the, the nice bits of the flavour. Starting with a base of five or six ingredients and adding others later, Marie builds up her strawberry recipe. She's learnt to recognise 2,000 flavour components and can monitor the progress of her mixture, all by smell. One of the disadvantages about having a, a nose and being a human is it does get fatigued. The nose gets what we call fatigued in that you, you keep smelling things and in the end you can't smell anymore. And you might add a particular character and smell and you can't smell that character in the flavour because you're saturated, in which case I'll leave it for the day and I'll actually take some home with me. Um, because obviously the best environment is a, is a home environment where the air's fresh and clean and you haven't got all the, the chemicals floating about in the air here. Once Marie is happy with the flavour, it's mixed into a sugar solution and actually tasted. A group or panel of tasters is asked to describe the fruit and the product. When the flavours are brought into me, I get a group of people, our panel, to taste them and to assign characters or attributes to them. In this case, it was our strawberry flavour. And the panellists are given forms like these and they have to look down at the different characters and decide just how much of that character there is in the flavour. Once all this is done, I get the very exciting job of sitting down and measuring the lines, which is what I was just about to do. So each of the lines is 100 millimetres. And so if I were to measure this one, I could see that that was 47, so I'd just write 47 on there. But I would go through and measure something like 400 different lines for each flavour. What we then do is transfer the information onto a spider plot. And that's almost as if you could imagine taking all of this end of the lines together, joining them together, and then spreading out the lines. And I'll just show you the axes on the computer. So we see the axes drawn up, and all of the characters or attributes that each panellist was looking for 
Then if I show you what we've actually done for a strawberry and for a strawberry flavour, the red profile is the profile for the flavour and the blue one is the profile for the actual strawberry. If the two shapes are very similar, we can tell that the flavours are really quite close. The only really important thing that is quite far away from is authenticity, but you would imagine that because people automatically think that a strawberry is a lot more authentic than a strawberry flavour, even if it does taste like strawberries. And down here on fresh, again, we can see that the strawberry is very much fresher than the flavour. But other than that, because the shapes are so similar, we can say that this is actually a very good strawberry flavour. But judgments of taste are affected by surroundings. Soft lights, sweet music, guaranteed to make a meal taste good. But what happens if something goes wrong? <coughs> If you ate in a restaurant like this... Not that you'd ever want to. How delicious could food be served in a public lavatory? Oh, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> so how can you arrange a fair situation in which to taste and judge food? Many things can affect how people evaluate the taste of a particular food. So when we're doing testing, there are a lot of things that we have to think about and a lot of things that we should try to control if we want to make a fair test and get a good idea of what somebody thinks about a, a particular food sample in a fair sort of way. And you'll notice that the sensory testing area is completely set off from the rest of the building. So the people who come in here don't see where we've prepared the food that they might be evaluating. They don't see other people here. They're really just coming in and, and working within this area. These booths are each separated by these fairly firm partitions so that the people who are sitting, the person who's sitting here is quite well separated from the other people who are sitting in the other booths. There's a strong airflow in here so that you can remove smells and flavors from the room. The color on the inside of these is a sort of a, a, a whitish or off-white uh, color, and that's a, a fairly good background for us to do color evaluation. It's not any sort of strong, distracting, uh, say, wild stripes or polka dots uh, in here. We have a sink there, and the, the reason for that sink is, is sometimes when we're doing sensory evaluation, we want people to be just to sip or to sample and then spit out the food that they've got. We have a serving hatch here. And the samples that people are evaluating are sent in through there from the other side. It's usually just raised a bit. The sample comes in, so you wouldn't be able to see or communicate with the person who's giving them to you. It just comes up, the sample appears, and then it would be lowered back down from the other side. So if you want to take a, uh, a seat here, and uh, we'll see if we can't find you something to, something to sample. Thank you. I'm now coming through, we have an alleyway which runs up behind the booth that you're in, and I can see you through the hatch here, which is where I would, I would serve things to you. Now you may wonder about why we changed the lights in there, and the reason for this is to mask the visual differences between the samples. One of the things is that we want people to be evaluating the taste or the smell of these and the appearance of them can often influence those judgments. So something like this, which is darker, may seem or may be judged to have more flavor or be sweeter, even though they're really essentially identical, except for a bit of coloring in some cases. So we give you the red light. In addition, for some things like this, we put them into colored glasses. And I think that you'll find that uh, that fairly effectively masks the differences in appearance between them. Why don't you take a look? That's brilliant. They look exactly the same. But one of the problems is that as soon as I open this, there's a flood of white light goes in there. So what we do is we turn on some red lights in here, and we turn off the white lights in here. And now, when we open and close the hatch from in here, there isn't that flood of light. So by controlling the lighting in there, by giving you the red lights there, by putting the red lights in here, 
by putting these things into these darkly colored glasses, we can eliminate the effect of the visual differences between these samples, and hopefully then, you'll really be evaluating them only on their differences in taste and smell alone, and the differences in appearance won't affect your judgments. Now I'd like to give you a chance to try something else. What's this going to be? Well, these are actually yogurts. Samples are given a three-digit number, never A and B, or one and two, which might suggest that one is better than the other. Which is sweetest? Which has most strawberry flavor? Which is thickest? The hatch is closed. In the red light, I can't see if they're the same color. I know nothing about them except the number on the label, so the test is as fair as possible. We know there are genetic influences on what people are capable of tasting and smelling. There are differences between males and females. So males and females differ in their sensitivity to dis different taste and flavor compounds. And there are also differences related to age and developmental effects. So uh, we all recognize that, for example, many children prefer things to be much sweeter than adults do. This is a developmental effect. There are also things associated with the environment in which people are tasting foods. And many of these are the things, sorts of things that we talked about. Now, the appearance of the foods, knowledge about uh, the brand, or perhaps the origin, such as whether something is organically grown or traditionally grown, may influence our judgments of its sensory qualities. One pot of yogurt shared between two sampling bowls. The only difference is the description one is said to be farmhouse, made with natural flavour, and the other to have synthetic flavour and added preservatives. The yoghurt in the pots is identical. Which sample has the better texture? Which sample has the stronger flavour? Which sample do you prefer? Preferences were mixed, but most people thought the farmhouse texture was better and that the synthetic flavour was stronger. So labels seem to affect perception of taste. So how we think food tastes is very complex. It depends on what you know, what you think you know, where you are, what you see, your sense of smell, as well as the taste buds on your tongue. Now, that's food for thought.